Hey everyone, it's Jeremy Siner, and I'm a texture and material artist. Welcome to part two of my series where we discover if you can texture on an M1 Mac. In part one of this series, we opened up Substance Designer and I created a quick rock material from scratch, testing its performance on an M1 MacBook Air. Check out the link in the top here or in the description down below for that video. I promise you won't be disappointed. I was really excited to see how Rosetta 2 was able to translate the Intel code from the unoptimized version of Substance Designer into native Apple Silicon code and just how well it performed with no hiccups or delays. As somebody who spends most of his time in Substance Designer these days, these results made me really eager to see that I could possibly transition back to the Mac. But Substance Designer is only half the story when it comes to texturing 3D models. A lot of people use another app in the Substance suite as their main texturing program of choice, Substance Painter. Substance Painter allows you to apply materials and effects directly onto your 3D geometry using materials, smart layers and filters, and brushes, just like you would in Adobe Photoshop. You might think of it like this. Substance Designer is where you create the materials, where Substance Painter is where you apply them to your models. These two apps work really well in tandem, so it made perfect sense to make a part two to see how well Substance Painter behaves on an M1 MacBook Air, using Rosetta 2 to translate on the fly. Let's talk a little bit about how I'm going to test this machine. Substance Painter is designed to scale its performance with the system resources that it is given. That means, like most professional software, the better your hardware is, the more that you can throw at it. So when it came down to figuring out how I wanted to present this video, I had to take into account if anyone's going to be using a light, thin laptop as their texturing machine of choice, they're most likely going to be working on lighter assets. And when I mean lighter, I mean optimized props for games, clothing, smaller vehicles, you know, props like that, not so much heavier, larger scenes or something with multiple UDIM tiles or like theatrical quality skin texturing, things like that. We're looking at a resolution anywhere from 2K to 4K as the maximum. Now, based on how well Substance Designer ran on this M1 MacBook Air, I'm expecting some similar results, workable performance that allows me to get the job done and feel happy about it. Now let's see if I'll be right, disappointed, or enthusiastically surprised. All right, so let's open up Substance Painter on the M1 MacBook Air. Okay, so it's opened up here, I'm just gonna hit close. And yeah, we got all of our materials loading up, awesome. So what I wanna do is open up a previously made file from my PC laptop. So I'm just gonna open, okay. So we're opening up now. Great, okay, so here is the, some of you might recognize this from a previous video series that I've done, but we've got my sci-fi weapon that I was making a personal project for my portfolio where I was making a sci-fi weapon for VR games and VR work. Great, so it's all loaded up here. Uh, I'm gonna use option and click and drag to move around. Viewport is moving pretty quickly. Let's zoom in. If I hit Option and Command and click and drag, we can pan. Option, and I think it's right click on the pen to zoom in. So yeah, the performance is looking good. I'm noticing a little bit of anti-aliasing. Let's go to the preferences here and we can see we have viewport scaling set to auto. You can also set this to none. I've also got, if I go to my display settings and scroll down, you'll see that I have uh, temporal anti-aliasing enabled. So those jagged edges go away after a little bit of time. So yeah, performance is looking pretty good here in terms of viewport. And let's see what resolution I'm working at. This is at 4K, okay. Let's see what I can do. I'm gonna to go to my layers and I want to toggle some of these layers to see how quickly Substance Painter can refresh the layers that are in its memory, process all of the filters and everything that I have. Like this particular procedural dirt has a dirt filter and also a paint on it. So let me just take this off. And, and again, we're working at 4K here. You can see we've got our progress bar at the bottom. So 
So great. Okay, so that's done. And let me just bring it back on. And we're back on. So that took a little bit of time, but Substance Painter works a little bit different than you might imagine. And so you might find that as you're working and building up a project, performance might get a little bit better. And I'll show you what I mean by this in a minute. But let me now go to the texture set settings and change this to 2K. And let's take a look at some of this performance. So I'm going to switch this to 2K. What it's going to do now is process all of the layers and recompute all the procedural aspects of how this is textured. It's looking like it's going pretty quickly, like that's already done. Great. Not too much of a difference in the viewport really for this kind of asset. Uh, what I can do now is, let's say I want to go and get a new, well, let's do a fill layer here. Move this up to the top. You can see that's going to populate and now fill this whole thing with white. Yep. And what I'm going to do now is create a black mask. And I'm going to add a paint layer onto this black mask. Let's see how this performs. Wow, so that's like near instant. So that's good. If I just move around a little bit, shift and right click to move the lighting. You can see I can paint on here, no problem. And I can switch up the brush to something like cement, get some wear and tear on here. Good, that's as expected. So I'm going to go ahead and delete that layer. Out of curiosity now, I want to jump into iRay here and see how that performance is. iRay was pretty good in Substance Designer. Let's see how it is in Painter. Well, there you go. Uh, pretty much converging here. You can see the iterations in the top right. I can rotate around, get another view, hold Shift, and right click and move the light around. This isn't pretty bad when it comes to look dev. And if you wanted this for like a portfolio render, something like that, you could absolutely get this done in a quick amount of time and get some good quality. So that's impressive, especially because this is working on the CPU and not the GPU and being translated, of course, with Rosetta 2 because this program's binary hasn't been optimized to work natively with Apple Silicon yet. Next up, what I want to do is I want to go through just creating a quick asset, texturing things, baking some mesh maps, like the usual workflow that you would have when using Substance Painter. So I'm going to go to File, New, and I'm going to set this document resolution at, well, yeah, let's go 2K, Direct X, and let's get that mesh open. And I'm not going to auto unwrap and hit OK. So I'm not going to save to this project. Okay, so I've loaded in this model, pretty simple. You can see I've got those jagged edges along the mesh here. So let's do some housekeeping. I'm just gonna go into my display settings and activate that temporal anti-aliasing. And immediately you can see that goes away. That's good. I also, what I wanna do is go to the anisotropic filtering and change this from medium to high. That just helps with reflections and makes things a tiny bit more realistic. So the first thing that I usually want to do is bake some mesh maps. And you'll be doing that a lot in Substance Painter. So what I'll do is go to Texture Set Settings and then Bake Mesh Maps. So I'm going to want, let's go with a 2, eh, yeah, let's go with a 2K size. And I'm going to do Normal World Space. I don't need ID. Image occlusion, curvature, position, thickness. Awesome. Let's go bake default and let's see how this does. Wow. So immediately we've got the normal world space and ambient occlusion is now processing. You can see a little preview behind me. And Getting through the thickness map. Done. All right, that didn't take very long at all. Okay, hit OK. So we've got our ambient occlusion now. Things are looking a little nicer. So that was pretty good. I'd say baking mesh maps 
although not quite as fast as when you would have like an NVIDIA GPU or something like that, still pretty reasonably doable. So next up, what I want to do is just start adding some materials. So I'm going to go through, find the materials that come with Substance Painter, and I'm going to search for some metals. Got a lot of really neat metals here. For the first version of the sci-fi weapon, I created my own materials in Designer, but let's just use some that were already built in. So I've got a neat steel rust and wear. So I could just drag this into the layer stack and remove that default layer. You can see everything's been applied. The scaling might be a little bit off, so let's increase the scale here. Don't want too many repetitions going on. And I can also choose like which meshes in this mesh, which part of the OBJ this gets applied to by clicking on this box. This is a relatively new feature. So I can go here and say exclude all, and then maybe I just want that to go on the front barrel. Maybe the piece under here, um, this piece here. Great. So we've got, yeah. And then let's choose another kind of metal. I'm thinking we could try the steel rough and adjust that scale. That's cool. I'll pick some of the meshes here. Let's deselect them all. And maybe I'll do this piece, this piece. Great. Let's get a plastic on this back. Quickly add that, and maybe add that plastic to this grip. And I wonder if I did that piece as well. Okay. This is very quick, just to show kind of like what the performance is like. Maybe I'll add the plastic to this top part as well. Okay, and now let's start using some smart filters. Now, again, I'm not trying to make a beautiful piece of artwork here. I'm really just trying to show how the performance is going. Oh, and I do want to put like that copper on the everything else. <laughs> cool. So now what I want to do is I want to add some dirt. So what I can do is go and create a new fill layer here. Let's bump it up to the top. And you can see as I'm doing this, as I'm adding layers, the performance is actually pretty good. We weren't having that progress bar loading across the bottom as I toggle through because all of these things are already in memory. We've got the eight gigabytes of memory in this particular MacBook Air. So that's interesting. I can relayer these things, rearrange it. Looks like it's happening instantaneously. Uh, great. So what I'm going to do is add another black mask. In this black mask, I'm going to add a generator. And I'm going to use the dirt generator. Awesome. So that loaded on pretty quickly. That's good. What I can do is I can change the dirt level. And that's happening rather fast. That's processing rather quickly. To change the contrast. Let's change the color. So I'm just going to deal with roughness and color. I can hold option to just select roughness and add color onto that. Let's make the dirt more rough. Let's change that color. Let's add some saturation. I'll make it like a brown, like a dark brown. Maybe make it slightly more red. And then I can go back and readjust the dirt. And yeah, Substance Painter is responding pretty quickly. This looks like a very dirty weapon, <laughs> but there we go. Now, if I wanted to say paint on a little extra dirt in a particular place, what I can do is add a paint layer to this mask. And what I can do is go to my brushes. We'll find that cement. Let's just like zoom in here onto maybe this section. And I can just paint in some more dirt. Good. And then press X to remove. Paint in around here. So this is looking like a relatively smooth experience, especially when you're working in a small asset like this and you're building up this over time and there's not too many generators. What I can do now is go and switch this to 4K. You can see it's going to process through our layers. And there aren't nearly as many layers as there were on the first example, but here you go. That's done. And I can continue to paint. 
There we go. And now let's say I want to take a look at this in iRay. So I'll just switch over. And let me get rid of the environment here. I'll just choose clear color. And you can see this converging. All relatively painful process, I think. Not really stalling or waiting for things to bake or to load or to process. For this kind of a quick prop job, it's been doing pretty well. Last thing I want to do is use a stencil. So I'm going to go to my grunge shelf here. I'll pick something like this one. What I'll do now is go back into that paint layer. Let's just scroll up here. And I'm just going to grab it and put it in my stencil. And this overlays it across the screen. And so I can zoom in, find a space, and just paint on a little bit from that stencil. It takes a second to load that stencil into memory, but there we go. In fact, what I want to do is now get my brush and do like a basic hard. You can see now it's putting that onto the mesh. And I can go down here maybe and add another little speck there and remove the stencil. You can see we've got those markings. So there you go, really quick and dirty, <laughs> adding some materials, using some generators, reorganizing layers. I could put the copper on top if I want everything to be copper now. This is all running at 4K. Nice. So I think it's safe to say I'm impressed. This eight gigabyte M1 MacBook Air can easily texture assets in 4K in Substance Painter. Baking mesh maps, well, not quite as fast as using an NVIDIA GPU or dedicated graphics card like that, was pretty fast, very workable. Granted, I was only baking at 2K and only using one UV tile instead of multiple UDIMs, but I could definitely see that being a possibility here. Viewport performance was absolutely great. It was just like it was on my PC laptop, no lag. And with the temporal anti-aliasing, I was able to get rid of all the jagged edges and increase the samples to get better reflections. Where I did see some slowdown was when I wanted to toggle on or off larger layers or layers with more complex filters in the masking when those layers weren't already loaded into memory. I imagine this has something to do with the eight gigabytes of memory that we have to use. And we have to remember that that memory is being managed differently than on computers before the M1. This is a shared memory architecture where I do believe that the same eight gigabytes of memory is being distributed through the GPU and the CPU. The beefier 18 gigabyte model might do you a lot better for more complex files. Now layers that we were actively using or when we were building up the file from scratch on our own, those were turning on and off and being painted on relatively easily with no lag or any delay in performance. I could create a new mask layer and then paint on it with no problem at all. Switching to the iRay renderer, just like in Substance Designer, was absolutely painless. Panning and rotating the camera was relatively smooth and you could get a very clean converged rendered image in a very short amount of time. This is great for look dev. And if you wanted to create your own portfolio renders, maybe on ArtStation or somewhere else, I could see it not taking a very long time at all to get that image to clean up and then export that out. We are talking about stills though. I would not recommend using this machine to create animations this way just yet. So turntables might take you a little bit of time, but stills, great. I see this particular machine as useful for somebody who wants to take their texturing and asset creation pipeline on the go, at least for a temporary time frame. You could start a project or take a project on the go while you're traveling, which is looking like a bit more of a reality now, and either get that project started or make some quick adjustments while you're traveling. But to answer the big question for this whole series, can you texture on an M1 Mac? The answer is, Yes, it's absolutely possible. If you're looking to start your material making or texture applying journey, you shouldn't have to worry about choosing an M1 Mac 
as the machine to get you going. Now I want to say this with a couple points in mind. This is Apple's first desktop chip, but they are no stranger to making built-in chips like these. All of Apple's iPhones and iPads have been made with Apple chips since the beginning. The M1 chip is the gateway to Apple making faster chips. They wouldn't transition to this new architecture without scalability in mind. So this means a couple really good things for us. Number one, faster chips are coming. As of this recording, Apple is still transitioning their pro lineup of computers to Apple Silicon. Meaning if you thought Substance Designer and Painter were fast now, imagine what they're gonna be like when they have even more powerful Apple chips inside. Number two, we're still using Rosetta 2. We're still translating the old code into the new on the fly, which takes part of that processing power away from doing the tasks that you want to do. So because Substance Painter and Designer are unoptimized, you can still expect a performance bump further down the line when these apps do become optimized for Apple Silicon. Also, I would like to note that I have been screen recording on the MacBook Air while creating these videos and doing all of this testing. I'm curious to know if you're interested in using an M1 Mac to do your 3D work. You've got plenty of devices to choose from. You have the new 24 inch iMac, you've got the Mac mini, you've got the MacBook Pro, the smaller model, I believe the 13 inch. All three of those have fans, which means you're gonna get better performance than the MacBook Air that we have that doesn't have one. While it's still the same chips, it can perform heavier loads for lengthier time because it doesn't have to worry about throttling back for overheating. Still pretty amazing that the MacBook Air doesn't get very hot even after doing all the testing that I've been doing. Like any review or testing, it all depends on your particular use case. I hope that with these two videos, you get a better idea of what the state of texturing on a Mac currently looks like. If you do have any questions, please feel free to leave a comment down below. I've already heard from a couple of you that have made the transition and the switch, and so far, they're pretty happy with their decision. Now, I've got a couple of new tutorials in the pipeline for Substance Designer, so if you're interested in those, hit subscribe and hit the bell to be notified when I post new videos. And if you like this one, hit the thumbs up. It lets me know that you're watching and it does help me out quite a bit. That wraps it up for today. I'm Jeremy Siner. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.